Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. Oh, yeah, it is the Friday Night Racing the weekend before the start of the Cheltenham Festival. So if you're a racing fan, you're obviously pretty, pretty, pretty excited about this. How excited are you, Johnny? Yeah, I am excited. Uh, it's hard to believe it's just come upon us like that. And uh, four great days of racing. I think, you know, some serious superstars um, to be seen. Not that many horses out injured as well. So an awful lot to look forward to from the comfort of our own home. When did the affectation of wearing the um, whatever it is that you're wearing on your neck, is it you just got a cold neck over the last... You've, you've... Oh. The last couple of weeks, it's been noticeable. There's been a significant uptick in the Johnny Ward fashion stakes. I put it on to put on a mask in the shop and I forgot to take it off. It's a Clane Wheelers. Uh, I think they call it a snood, is it? Clane Wheelers Cycling Club. Ah, so. okay, okay. I thought it was like yeah. a, a 1920s gentleman's type. Uh, okay, it's, all right. it's just a plain old boring snood, it turns out. Grant, well, free advertising for the Clane Wheelers. We're all about that. Uh, Very convenient if you forget to have your mask when you're going to the shop, which happens a lot. I'm sure it's uh, also uh, scientifically <laughs> as effective as all of those masks that we've invested in. Anyway, let's move on quickly. Friday Night Racing brought to you by HRI, Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie and you can follow the Twitter account at HRI Racing. The hashtag is every racing moment. Our guest this week, I'm sure, is even way more excited than we are about Cheltenham because it won't be from the um, comfort of his own couch. Paul Hennessy, good afternoon to you. How are you? I'm good, thank God. How are you? Yeah, so when, when do you make the trip to Cheltenham? Um, hopefully we intend going out on Sunday afternoon from Dublin to Hollyhead and that should get us down to Cheltenham about 11 or 11.30pm. OK, and what's the what's the plan of action at that point? Well, you see, it's very little. It's all laid out for us this year. It's a very, very unusual year. Last year we went over for the Supreme Novice Winter it was really a matter of just jumping into the box and away we went and our tails in the air and it was great crack but this year is a completely different scenario you wouldn't believe the amount of paperwork tests licenses it's un- it's incredible the amount of stuff we have to do to even to leave ireland and um when we go to Cheltenham, we have to enter by a certain road in on the track into a, a green zone you get tested on the way in and you have to stay in that green zone then for your stay in Cheltenham. Um, you cannot leave that area. So it's a, it'll be a big difference. It'll just purely for the race. And, but it's wonderful that the event is going ahead. And if this is what it takes, then we're glad to, you know, tow the line. So you're getting there late Sunday night. And I think, if, if I'm not uh, wrong, the Carl Cup's on Wednesday. So, you, I mean, obviously you'll be watching the race. And will you be allowed to go to the racetrack? Or is it like you're strictly allowed on the racetrack for that set period of time that you need to be there to get the horse there? watch the race and go home afterwards? No, you're not allowed onto the race course, only on race days. Now, you are allowed to bring the horse down the race course to the schooling area, which is in the centre of the race course in Cheltenham, uh, in the mornings. And the horses can go down there and stretch their legs and, you know, whatever they want to do, have a hack around just to loosen up and keep, you know what I mean, and to get them out of their stables. But on race days, then only the people with horses running are allowed to return to the race course. Okay. Um, but that's look at that's the way it is, and that's the safe way to do it. And we're, as I say, we're privileged actually to be going. We only keep a small number of them here, and to have one. And this will be her third visit, please God, to Cheltenham, which is quite amazing, you know. Well, look, let's let's give everybody a sense of of heaven help us. This is um, from the Dublin Racing Festival. I want everybody to watch the the uh, the race finish, obviously, because it's it's by a whisker. But if you've got time and your eyes are so inclined, check down in the bottom left corner of the screen here to see two lads jumping up and down going absolutely book mental. Have a look at this. Racing to the final flight, up from his fault too is Hugh Morgan, it's heaven help us out in front, with one flight left to jump, from Global Equity, Razzle Dazzle Love, tell me something, get a Lady Breffney runs on, ahead of Rula Bula Batani, and Tucani, and away from the final flight, in the lead is heaven help us from Global Equity, who's closing against the rail, and then tell me something, girl, and Lady Breffney, all out, heaven help us, with launching on the inside, Global Equity, heaven help us, well just see it out from Global Equity tell me something girl oh, that's class that's how maybe 16 year olds behave not 60 year olds but look the excitement of that is just incredible you know the chances of us ever even or even to compete in a normal sort of horse race is wonderful it really is it's a great thrill 
Um, and to win a race, it's huge. Like, I mean, we might have been lucky enough to win one race a year or whatever. But to win a race of that standard is just incredible. And I knew coming to the finish, you know, that's about the only opportunity we we're going to get ever to do that. And um, so when she, to hold on was amazing because you can't really run live action, as you know. And um, so to, that's why I was leaning forward to see the line, just trying to hope that she got there in time because had she not got there in time, the chances of doing that again are probably nil for us, you know. And to, to see off being nearly caught on the line as well, the so that's the heart attack inducing and then it's just like, oh, wow, we just managed to hold it off because like five more yards and you're not sure, but... The, the finish line comes at just the right time for for your horse. And we were lucky because we were standing over at the at the and the ambulance road or near it. And the first time around, I went to walk out and I forgot the cameras were going to be coming up the road and the ambulance up the road to get back in. But when they passed, we walked out across the track to the centre just to get a better view, really, of the race. To be honest, and um, luckily we happened to be standing near the line. So when she crossed it, I knew she'd held on and. Look at it, it was wonderful. As I said, it was a one off. We were only going to get one opportunity at that level. And thanks be to God, it worked out for us. You know, there was no reruns at that level, not for us anyway. How many horses do you have? Um, we have three in training. Now, I keep a brood mare or two. I, we bred heaven help us as it happens. So we've, we've kept a mare here over the years. I always had a, a big interest in them, you know, because we were neighbours to the Mullins growing up. And that's where the, the love for the horses started off, I suppose. But we have three in training, herself, a horse called Recite a Prayer and another fellow called Right Turn Trade. Right. Uh, heavenly inspiration along the names for, well, for a couple of them anyway. Clint Eastwood was Right Turn Trade. Well, what happened is we bought this horse from uh, Martin Lenny, the guy that's in that picture with me, and uh, he's out of a mare called River Clyde. And when I saw the passport, I said to Martin, there's only one name for this fella. And that's Right Turn Clyde. So, you know, you remember the film, was it Dirty Harry or some of them with the yeah. rang it blurry, so... Oh, yeah. That's what his name, right turn trade. But anyway, <laughs> we call him Speedy Gonzalez because he's not doing an awful lot at the moment, but all this time yet. But Heaven Help Us is, is obviously a really good horse. She's wonderful. Um, it, nobody really knows how good she is because I'm just training her here. I mean, if she was in with a proper trainer, she could be a lot better. But look, she's been very lucky for us. We've had great fun with her from the very beginning. She ran in a very good mare's bumper in... in um, Ballon Robe first him out and finished fifth and we were delighted like a Gypsy Island one and she's a very very good mare um, and then we just ran in all the big races we could find there was no logic to what we've been doing we took a mad idea to run in a maiden hurl in Cheltenham because John Turner who owns or lives near Cheltenham and we'd go over and get a couple of days and have a, a weekend and the whole thing and she went and won at a 33 to 1 with Danny Mullins on her <laughs> you know I mean and then after that I was sitting one day watching her come up to Gallop and my phone beeped with a message from HRI saying that the entries were closing for the Grade 1 novice hurl in Leperstown. And I says, sure, look, at she earned the entry fee anyway. We hit the button on my phone and entered her in the race. And lo and behold, she was the only mayor in the entry, so I thought I looked a bit silly. But it ended up she finished second in the Grade 1 because of that. I would never have thought of entering her had I known what you were supposed to be doing, to be honest with you. That's the truth. And um, we went from there then back to the Supreme Novices Hurl in Cheltenham again. And she got it was a very rough race now, but she ran brilliant. She finished seven staying on without trouble. We may well have been fifth in it, you know. To, and to have a runner in the Supreme Novice for us was just unbelievable, you know. I remember Dawson classes in school to watch the Sun Alliance hurl as it was then, Shawnee Tracy winning it on Council Cottage with Paddy Train, and you know. And you're brought up rare to the first race in Cheltenham was always a huge one for Irish anyway, because with the Irish interest and we would success in it over the years. But even for us to have had a runner in it was just amazing. It really was. The thrill was just immense. I mean, you'd be shaking walking her out to even put the saddle on her. You hoped that the saddle on the right way and everything else, you know. So it was wonderful. Is wonderful. that two years ago? That was last year. Yeah, last right. year. She won, she won in it, I think, a maiden hurl in October uh, 19. And then she ran into Sun Alliance last year in it. And ran great. Like, it was a great race. She's been won it and Abracadabra were second. Like, and they're two brilliant horses. Like, so... Like they're much a lot better than us, but we ran great, and that's a huge achievement in itself to go over and compete at that level and perform. It was wonderful. We were thrilled anyway. We were delighted. You talk about Sean Tracy there. All I remember, um, my early memories of the Thaises would have been two horses that trained local enough to you. Hedge Hunter 
for Paddy Mullins and be my bell for a short race. Just kind of when I got into racing, and it's lovely to kind of remember that. And I just wondered about the dam of Heaven Hill, the spear, the air, and how you got a hold of her, and also why you went to Yates in the first place, which would have been about eight years ago now. Yeah, I'll tell you very simple. Um, Martin Lenny, as I said, that the you know my partner in crime that's in that picture jumping around. Martin's at the sales one day, and I was busy here at home, and I said to him, if you see a filly, you know, with a reasonable pedigree, maybe. So we bought her cheap. Um, she wasn't correct, the mother that spared the air. And <laughs> two friends of mine, a brother-in-law, Philip O'Keefe, and a friend of mine, PJ Fahey, got involved with her, and we had her, and Philip, well, you wouldn't believe it, though, the way it happened. PJ trained the ladies, Galway ladies football team, and they are in a hotel after winning the Ireland, and they were going up in the lift, the lift got stuck. And it, it, anyway, there were about six of them in this lift and they'd had to call for security and call for everything else. And they were all in the and PJ told them to stay quiet and spare the air. That was lift. <laughs> lift. And that's how we called her spare the air. So look, at, anyway, it went on from there and she wasn't great. Now, she, I don't know if she ever even placed in a race, but she had a good pedigree. She's off the mild airline, which is a brilliant pedigree. And I took a chance breeding her and... Or below one evening at the gate, myself and Martin, you know, you romance about about horse racing. Anyone that's, you know, from the outside looking in, most of it is all romance. You never get to get involved, certainly not at this level. And, you know, we were great admirers of, of great friends with Aidan O'Brien anyway, but I mean, great admirer of the O'Brien horses or the Cool Moore horses and that. And Sir Yates was an unbelievable specimen of a horse, you know what I mean? He won four Ascot Gold Cups. He was by Saddler's Wells. You know, there was no reason. You'd only dream of getting a horse that even looked like him in the place. He's a huge horse, a great specimen. And Martin just said to me one evening, wouldn't, she, wouldn't the mother be a great mare to breed to Yates? Um, we had brought her to High Chaparral and she bred um, a horse called First Friday, who was, he was a great horse. He used to run for us nearly every week above in Dundalk. We have a rogue now, but he was, you know, we great sport of him. And um, that's how we went to Yates then. And this was the fall she had, a filly fall. And, we come on from there with her and the rest is history as I say but she's she's gorgeous you know what I mean she really is it's it's funny that you know you look at these horses that are probably not much good and then they breed and she say well why does he breed off her you know the the, the dam herself wasn't much good and yes you obviously saw something in the head and something about her that it might be worth taking a chance the only reason Johnny was because you know she was the only one I had <laughs> so if I wanted to breed a mare yeah. The one that was there, but she did have a good pedigree. She really did. Her her mother um, wasn't a good brood mare. Say, spare the air herself. Her mother was out of a mare called Clear Procedure, but she was out of trusted partner and you know dressed the trill and all those great mares that ran for the Mildlayer people. And you know they bred on a company them Free Eagle, and it's it, it is a brilliant line. And look, at, she just happened to throw on a few, then they could run. But obviously, heaven help us is the best by far that she has bred and. You know, so, you know, that's just the way it happens. You know, there's no... I, I know... You know, you can breed the best yeah. for the best and hope for the best, but, you know, you can, that's the beauty of it, let's say. That is the beauty of it, say, that people have a mare there and if she has anything going for at all, you can breed her to a horse and hope for the best rare or well, and who knows? You know, we what, just... What, look, what's it like... To, what's it like to be a breeder that, you know, because this is not maybe... Well, I like that part. I came from a farming background, mm. right? I had cows at home and all that, and I I like that uh, part of it. Now, it's very slow in National Hunt, but, you know, if you're prepared to wait and all the rest of it. Like, I have a, a half-sister of Heaven Help Us there, a mare called I Will Be Done, and she won a race for us one day in Punchestown as well, and I have a two-year-old out of her now by policymaker, the Sire of Shek Han and he's a nice horse. So look at the dream is there again then that maybe he's able to run. Who knows? You just have to, you know, roll the dice and see what happens. But the opportunities are there. And as I say, you know, um, it doesn't cost the earth to go to a National Hunt Stallion, really. You know what I mean? So, Paul, you breed the horse and then you keep the horse at home the whole way and then you train them as well. Is that right? Well, look, that's the way it worked out recently. I had no intentions of doing it. We used to bring them to the sales and sell them and maybe watch how they turned out afterwards. But... Um, as again, I've an awful lot to blame Martin Lanny for. We were here one evening with a little horse called Cheers Buddy, uh, that was a two year old, and he was, I think, he was fourth one day as a two year old, maybe third, but his form was in and out. He wasn't, you know, great, but anyway, we, we brought him home to rest him for the winter. And he said to me, Why don't you have a go at training him yourself? And I thought he was mad, but because we owned him ourselves, then we said, Sure, why not have a bit of crack and we tried? And 
that's where it started. We used to bring him over to Tony Mullins. Tony lives only five minutes over the road. And we used to ride him around his gallop and stuff like that. And as I say, we went up into the curve when we thought he was half ready one day and asked Jamie Heffern as a sitting him. And Jamie was brilliant. He gave us great advice. He said, you're not ready yet. Um, he walked him across the old dick and he said, you're not ready yet. That's just what the horse's rating was. And he said, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be there about off of the rating that he was at. And um, come back up in three weeks, which we did. Went back up in three weeks and he walked him again. He says, you're ready now to go. He says, enter him up in the next 10 days or thereabouts. And so the rest is history. We entered him in Dundalk on a Friday and we entered him in Gordon on a Sunday. And Shamey was suspended, but Joseph rode him. He was only a young fellow at that time and he was a five pound claimer. He rode him, Joseph O'Brien, and won on him in Dundalk, got up in the line and won by a neck or something. And Shamey won on him on the Sunday by a short edge. Right, that was going to be great, right? <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> that's unbelievable. Your first yeah. horse, first time training, first yeah. weekend out, two wins. Yeah, one horse ran twice and he won both times. <laughs> and I tell you one thing, I paid for that ever since, boy. What I did, there were days I went racing. <laughs> I'm just scratching my head and you're saying I shouldn't be doing this. Anyway. You should have retired at that point, 100% record. I said it on the night when Gary O'Brien asked me to interview me. I said, I think I should quit now, straight away, you know, and dream about what might have been. But then look at what has been. I mean, it's amazing, you know, and, and that's the way it is for everybody. There's no easy route. But the beauty of it was that um, we were training our own horse. You know, the one that we own, we only have one or two, maybe the most. and. So it was myself and Martin, and there was going to be no, you know, fallout or anything else if he didn't run so good. And we were doing our best. It mightn't have looked like it at times, but we were doing our best all the time. And then we learned as we went along a bit too. But as I say, she just took everything to a different level. I suppose, look, she's an awful lot more ability than the rest of them. And she's genuine. She'll try for you, you know, which, you know, is great too. What do you do facilities-wise in how complex was it to get the trainer's license obviously from your greyhound background was there much difference to do sorry i missed that now so what what was it like getting the trainer's license and it, what is your training facilities kind of since have you been using other gallops are you still using tonies or no no we're, we have our own gallop put in now and everything else you know and um what we have where we're placed here is quite good we have Doninga's only five minutes over the road, Doninga, Jerry Mullins' gallops, he'd be a cousin of Willie and George and all the lads. And he put in, uh, you know, public gallops that can be used in Doninga. And or else we use a gallop near Johnstown in um, County Kilkenny, Spa Hill, a beautiful hill gallop. There's a, a wood chip and there's grass gallops up there. But, um, yeah, no, it was good. We had to do all the, you know, get our license and everything else. and go back to school. And I remember the last day I left school, I was shutting the door saying to myself, I'm never going to do that again. But anyway, since then, we've had to go back to school a few times, you know, but um, having said that now, the subjects were a bit different than what the were when we were doing or leaving and things like that. Is there much of a comparison between training the dog to run as fast as he or she can and training the horse is the same? Um, I think a lot of training is, is, is routine, but the biggest thing I find with training is to spot a problem really before it comes a real problem. And that with horses, I couldn't do, you know, um, with the dogs, you're so used to it. I mean, I've been at the dogs for 40 years and, you know, so you have loads of experience. I mean, we a tiny bit of experience of maybe having a broodmare and bringing her to the horse and covering her and folding her and feeding her and that, you know, but when it came to training them, then that was totally different. And, it still isn't easy, but as I say, she fills in the blanks, you know what I mean? Um, and that's the beauty of it. She really is filling it in. And we get into a routine that we think suits her and she loves going away for a day. So we're able to bring her to Doninga or bring her to Spa Hill for a day up there and are at home for the basics. And I think that helps her too, to if the changes and that help, you know, that's not just all in the one place. And how would the two highs compare from your Greyhound successes, which um, is a smaller sport to Winning a race at the Dublin Racing Festival, considering you've only a handful of horses all your life, um, what was that compared to winning the big Greyhound races? Well, you see, I suppose you look at we set out our stall to go down the Greyhound route. Um, when I first I got my first Greyhound, she won a few races. A friend of mine was training for me, but um, when I got my second one, I was more kind of involved. And my father-in-law got be good to him. He was training her for me. And when I saw actually what was involved with the diet and everything else and galloping and all this carry on, 
it really caught my imagination and it just swept me aside. I just had to go with the flow. Um, and we've had a fantastic career in fairness. We've been very, very lucky and we've won a lot of the big competitions and the pure relief when you win one of those, you know, because it's kind of your job, but it's also a kind of a lifetime achievement to try and achieve to win a derby or anything else like that. And we've been blessed a few times to win it. So that's what that's like. And as I say, I remember when we won our first English derby, it was massive relief. I didn't think that that was up to four to finish. And he, you know, he hadn't tracked as good as he should, but he got there and uh, on the line. And that was massive because it's a huge um, undertaking to try and go for an English derby. It's, you know, the competition lasts for six weeks you know, over and back, or if you're staying there and everything else. So there's an awful lot involved in it. But the Dublin Festival then was a different kind of enjoyment altogether. That was just like, you know, someone saying to you, there's a dart, there's a board. Did you ever throw darts before? No. Well, watch what happens when you hit the bullseye and we hit the bullseye first time. It's like, you know, that program they have on the telly where they hit the golden ball and your man hits the, the thing or whatever, these singers come on and the talent competition, is it? Somebody, America's got talent or... The voice. Yeah, well, no, not the voice, no, the other one. The mass singer. Um, no, America got talent. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. This orange ball in the centre that your man goes straight through to the final. Do you know that one with all the explosions and then the, the glitter comes down around and everything else? <laughs> you must watch the same programme. I, mean. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know which one it is, but it's one of them anyway. Shows the programme, you know that one? You'd be all singing, and if you if the act is good enough, then someone will stand up, and, and not alone will they just get three corrects. They'll hit this golden ball, and all hell breaks loose. Yeah, Confetti no comes down on top of them. American Idol. Yeah, it could be, could yeah. be. I'm not going to say no anymore because obviously you don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, um, D&D doesn't know the name of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's like, you know. That yeah. happened, and I knew when she was coming to the line that this was never going to happen again in Leperstown. And this was our one-off chance and thanks be to God it happened. It really, it was so special. You have no idea because as I say, I grew up right beside the Mullinses and everything else and it meant an awful lot to win Paddy's race. That's like, I mean, Willie said it all to me afterwards. You know, Paddy says, I've been trying to win that race for years and that'll just show you how lucky we were, you know. Tell us about the Mullinses, will you, and growing up beside them. Actually, we all grew up together, open ponies and different things. We were crack like it. our home place, you know, and their home. Place, it's a, it was a great place to grow. Really, is lovely, friendly country area. All the neighbours would be in. We'd be playing hurling of an evening, or going off riding ponies if you're into that, or going to matches. Or it was just a lovely country, safe area for young lads to grow up. And we had the river Barrow near us. We just go down swimming in, in in the summertime and maybe go fishing as well, and all those country sports. It was great crack. It was a lovely place to grow up, as I say. And we used to go to Jim Cannes or whatever beyond the weekend, if they had Jim Cannes and that on, or Pony Club or whatever was going, I used to jump in and go with them anyway. I used to love it, you know what I mean? Now, my other family members didn't. They all doing their own other things, you know, whatever hurling would be going on and stuff like that. But as I say, it was just a lovely country area to grow up and doors were never locked in houses. You could walk into any house or walk out. You get your tea in whatever house you were in, you know what I mean? That was it. Did you learn from them? Was it kind of by osmosis? Were you interested? Like, you didn't, it sounds like you didn't get into the notion of horse training until much later. But at the same time, you're in the company of, you know, like a, a brilliant jockey who becomes a great trainer. I know, but you're looking, we weren't paying attention. It's very same as going to school. I mean, I often said it afterwards when I started training in Cheers Buddy, I said, why didn't I keep me always open and my mouth shut when it was over in Paddy's a bit more? It would have helped an awful lot more, you know what I mean? But now in fairness, I could ring any of the lads at any time if I had a problem or wanted to figure out something and they'd, they'd advise me the best they could. But um, no, I definitely, when I was up there growing up, it was for the sport and the fun of it more so than the learning, to be honest, you know what I mean? What sort of man was Paddy? Paddy, lovely, straight talking man, you know what I mean? I got on super with him. Um, and very quiet, you know what I mean? But um, when he'd say something, he'd say it, he'd mean it. But no, I did, I got on very, very well with him. He used to bring me to the races or if I wanted to go. I remember I was a young fellow at the races and I'd say it was in Tralee or Listol. He said to me, will you come home in the car with me? I was mad to stay below for the crack. But anyway, when he asked me to come home, I said I would to help him stay awake. Jeez, I fell asleep after about a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> he had to make his own way home but see anyway when we got home he said to me you weren't much used to me <laughs> <laughs> so 
She fell yeah. asleep the car out of him. So has <laughs> gone on too busy socialising when we got away from home. You know yourself when you're 16 or 17 years of age. But um, yeah, I look at not a good crack. But he was a great man, a great man to train horses, great man for deep. You know, like, I mean, how many, three Irish nations, but he still is the only man ever to train a, grand, a champion hurdle and a World Cup winner, you know, with the same, mm -hmm. with the same um, And, you know, to win a champion stakes with Hurry Harriet. You know, Paddy wouldn't have had a great sort of supply of top-class horses, you know, but, my God, I tell you one thing, you know, when it came down to the big day, he was a fantastic man to get a horse, you know, primed to the last to run for his life on a big day, like, you know. Something um, kind of uh, mystical about that as well, isn't there? The quiet kind of yeah, man yeah. and quiet who has to think about the horse and the remember the time We were there, um, we used to be right now in the summertime, in his years ago. Now, there was a horse called Brandon Hill. He was owned by a neighbour, Kevin O'Donnell, here in Gordon. So they were going to run him in the Irish Derby. And Sean Tracy used to ride him work and everything, you know. But I remember watching Brandon Hill. You could see the horse turning inside out in the last month into that derby, even though we were in England. There was a gleam off him, a shine off him, the muscle tone of him. And every, now, he ran brilliant. He finished fourth to Malachet or something like that in, in that derby, which was a huge, you know, effort out of out of him, you know what I mean, from that horse from the level he was at. But you could actually see, you know, the physical change in the horse. He looked amazing going to the corner that day for the derby, you know what I mean? But you could see the gradual change over the last, well, I could anyway, the last month into it. I didn't know what he was doing, but with the way he was training him and everything else, he had him primed to run for his life, and that was probably his best ever run, you know? It sounds like you were learning as, as time went on, though, that all this kind of stuff, you're observing it now. In retrospect, you're like, oh, I remember that now. That it, it, that yeah, but like, he was brilliant. I mean, you, you know, you know, big handicaps. Like, he was a fantastic man to, you know, Galway hurls and all these things, you know, big pot races, and he was chewing a handicapper to the last for the big day, and it showed then when he, you know, got the opportunity to train the mayor like Don Run, she, like she won the French, Irish and English champion hurls in the one year. You know, she went on to win a gold cup as well as a novice. I mean, he was just a brilliant man. He just understood animals and he worked with what he had and very modest. He wouldn't dare, you'd never hear Paddy talking of one of his horses or one of his jockeys either. Do you know what I mean? Very modest man and down to earth. And get on with it as a part of your job, and that's it. Go and do it, and be more about it. You know. Yeah, not a bad way for you to come up and kind of see that, and and I don't know, yeah. like it's yeah. it's kind of a cultural thing. It sounds it was like great London for us. Say if we, you know, you were lucky enough to get a bit of success that you didn't run off screaming and roaring and go on the beer for a week and all just carry on and forget what you're supposed to be doing. Um, I learned an awful lot of that from watching Paddy. You know what I mean? Winning and losing. Well, it wasn't always the same. He'd be fairly bad humour sometimes. Now to get <laughs> Um, you know, but when he won, it was a matter that was your job, go and do it and, and take it as a come and, and go home and start again tomorrow. You know, like we often remember going over dances, myself and George, we'd be rambling in around maybe half one or two. It wasn't unusual to see Paddy out with a wheelbarrow going around giving all the horses a scoop of boats. Right, at half one, yeah. two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah. And he'd be first man in the yard again the following morning and then to start the whole show. No, he was a fierce, dedicated man. Oh, unreal. I love the attention to detail of when Vintage Chippel was, um, I think she was probably when she was in transit generally later um, in his life, obviously, and that was his big swan song, but she was a notoriously bad traveller, I think, very skittish, so he used to get in um, with her as she was travelling, and he was probably in his mid to late 80s at that stage, just get into the back with her and mind her so that she'd be okay. That's the truth, and that was petty for you. He'd, he'd figure out what each animal needed, now, you know, he'd figure it out. He's a great man that way. He's a great communication with his horses. Well, that's what I thought anyway. But, you know, had Ginny Mac, it was, a, it was a great setup, like, too. I mean, you know, he had Willie there and Tony and Tom and George and Sandra, like, you know, and Maureen as well. Like, it was a great unit. I mean, you know, they were a great bunch to work. And, my God, they didn't have, you know, wind it all up to spin out the winners. They were a great team. There's no question. And sure, all you have to do is look ahead now again. You know, Willie had carried it on. And, to him as well and Tony they come in, in the train and George is into the transport business you know so they've kept it going I was even only saying to Sandra this morning that I see a picture on the Irish racing.com yesterday Emmett and Patrick um, mm. yesterday but the picture has the two of them tagged out for jockeys and I said only about 16 at the time but I said to her that the Mullins tradition is in safe hands with the young fellas that are coming on now with those four boys like David and Danny and 
Patrick and Emmett, like, I mean, you know, they have, they, they're fairly clued into the racing game at the moment. Paul, it's obviously the Carl Cup next Wednesday. Um, I know you said that Leopardstown felt like it was a once in a lifetime opportunity, but the horse is really good. So, you know, she's going to keep going. She's going to keep improving. There's a few more chances for her to give you big days, too. Oh, there is, of course. As long as she stays sound, and thanks be to God, she has never had as much as a toothache. I mean, she's been brilliant all the way through. And um, she's. Look, it's, it's 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 we're higher in the handicap. Johnny will know all about that. It's a better race than the race, not taking anything from the race in Dublin. Um, I think all the little dots lined up, all our ducks lined up in a row in the Dublin race. It was her first run in the handicap. She was often marked that on her best form when she was second to Cadaver, we thought she had a chance. Richie Condon, who rode her, gave her a peach and took seven pounds off her. So, you know. A lot of things lined up for us in the Dublin race, and we knew she had good form in Leprosum. Now, okay, she has decent form in Cheltenham too, but this would be a different kettle of fish in the sense that it's it's a higher rated race. We only hope she get into the um, Coral Cup, and she's rated 138 over there, which is, you know, what, 12 pounds higher than what she was in Dublin. So that'll tell you the standard of the race. It's a higher standard. Now, look at two mile and five. I think it'll even bring out more improvement in her. I think she stays going at a steady pace for a good while. I think she's capable of doing that. I think she'll probably even run over three miles in time, but um, it is exciting. It's wonderful to go over. She's fit, she's well, she's in good humour, she's in good form. And, you know, hopefully she will run well and it will be a big day out for us all. Well, listen, you're, you're one of the Thanks. lucky few who's getting the opportunity to get off the island and it's totally well-deserved. Go on, Johnny, sorry. Yeah, I, I guess... Um... Just two more questions for you, the the concept of her maybe jumping fences, but also breeding off her in time must be exciting as well. It's huge, Johnny, yeah, because, like, I mean, she's such a sweet animal that she has lovely um, temperament, you know, that she's easy to manage, and, and animals like that are a pleasure to be around, you know. Um, jumping fences, Johnny, we tried that start of this season. She won her beginner's chase. She was second in a beginner's in Chicago to a good mare of Henry de Bromis. She won her beginner's well enough. It mightn't have turned out to be a great contest now the way the farm has worked out. But she ran all right over fences. I thought she just wouldn't attack her fences the way you need to. You know, you can't give away a ground sort of thing in the better races anyway. So that's why we switched her back to hurls. She seems much happier jumping them. And look, with her pedigree being off the mile line, maybe hurling is her thing. And we're having great fun with her. And as I say, for as long as that will last and she's enjoying it, We'll walk away at the moment anyway, you know. Alison, it's some story, Paul. We'll let you go, but thanks a million for joining us today. Congratulations. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, Paul Hennessy there. You're listening to Friday Night Racing or you're watching us on any of our social channels or indeed on the OTB Sports app. Friday Night Racing is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. It's a remarkable story, Johnny. Unbelievable, you know. Uh, the, 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 there used to be the gag in the among the hacks when you'd ask a, a trainer he'd only have literally a handful of horses he'd have a, a winner and you wouldn't know the trainer well and you'd, you'd ask him um, how many of you in training and he'd say oh two or three and it's like well if you've only two or three surely you know whether it's two or three but that's um, that, Paul Paul was saying that so quoted. I mean when you've only one or two horses it's unbelievable so it's kind of this thing with small trainers can you imagine like winning your, with your first horse twice in the weekend and then breeding a horse like this who ends up winning at the Dublin Racing Festival and goes to Shelton with a realistic chance um, probably in the genes in terms of his success um, I think with the Greyhounds I think he kind of sums it up well there he had access to facilities early on and he also had access to um, the knowledge of his if his friends the Mullins is really and he also probably had the access or the, the help of the knowledge that Paddy Mullins would have imparted and um, it's a magical part of the world that he's talking about there you know very idyllic um, you know around along the River Barrow um, Tommy Tracy who I, I interviewed uh, a couple of times as his career was coming to an end he would have ridden for uh, Sean Tracy but Tommy used to tell me how when he was badly injured he um he used to swim against the tide in the River Barrow to get fit again, and it's like you can imagine how difficult that would be. And I remember he was—he was in a—he told me how he was in a, a race against Charlie Swan to be the champion jockey one one year, and he he rode for three weeks with a broken ankle. Um, and they're just made of hard stock in that that region. It's around about the kind of Carlo Kenny border, but um, you know the importance of racing to rural Ireland. That place just lives for racing between the Mullinses and Shark Hanlon, obviously. Um, you know the the man we spoke to as well, and 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 a lot of other trainers around that region, and um, it's just a fantastic part of Ireland. Yeah, no, look, and obviously we'll we'll be talking every day on the show across all our channels about the individual days racing. So we're not going to get into too much of a Cheltenham preview just yet. 
this week on uh, Friday Night Racing. Jamie Hart from the Tote is with us. Um, Jamie, good afternoon to you. How are you doing? Good, guys. Good. Good, good to be here. So listen, um, Jamie, say, say this is a hypothetical situation. Say you and one of your mates were involved in a competition and uh, your mate wasn't really an expert, but you obviously, being from the Tote, are a complete expert and are expected. Say it was a, a, a tend-to-follow competition and one of your mates was actually hammering you in this competition. Do you think they would be kind and let you win in the when it comes down to it in, in Cheltenham? Or would they try and ram home that advantage? Like, What, what would you I do? <laughs> I think that this is happening everywhere. We've got a big competition at work as well, obviously, and um, all of the people that we wouldn't expect to be in the lead are in the lead, and some of us that spend all our days going through the form uh, needing Cheltenham to come good for us so we can, we can overtake them. We, we're, we're sitting behind. We're just telling them we're sitting behind, catching a lead and just ready to take them on the on the final kind of furlong. But, uh, I would. I think there's a few there. I think the county hurdle is going to be the, the key to everything because nobody knows what's going to win that, and it's a bonus race, so... That's going to be the big scorer. To be honest, what I did was I looked at the bonus races and I picked as many horses in the bonus races as I could get, and that has given me a fairly sizable lead over Johnny. So um, I don't know. Now that I've outed myself and my strategy, he might uh, he might learn what to do. Tell us exactly what's what's going on here because there's a, there's the game within the game. I think um, yeah. would be a good way of putting it. Yeah. So so we've got the main game, uh, the ten to follow, and that's in uh, you get to swap out two of your horses at this stage. So between now, so it's open for swaps for transfers now until monday night 10 o'clock monday night before the big the big uh, kickoff uh, you can swap out to any two of your horses so there's a lot of people like i, th- I think um joe's got delta work in his in his tent so he- he'll be able to come in and, and swap that out anybody else that's that's got a couple that either aren't aren't going to be going for anything big for the rest of the season or may have been uh, laid out laid off for the rest of the season they should be going in there and changing those before tuesday before uh, Tuesday starts up to Monday night at 10 like I say now for other people that might be so far off the pace that they think they've they've gone completely or they didn't get in on the main tent to follow we've done a uh, we've set up a, a mini tent to follow that's just going to take place over the four days of the Cheltenham Festival which means you can, it's exactly the same scoring system exactly the same bonus races that are during the Cheltenham Festival but you can go in there you can put you can play it for free and then then Cheltenham and Leopardstown have uh, been generous and put up some prizes for that so you can win annual membership at Cheltenham or uh, hospitality at Leopardstown at the Christmas meeting fingers crossed we are back having hospitality by then at least um, uh, but you can, or you can pay do the pay game uh, which is five euro fifty or five pounds if you're paying pounds and and you go into the pool for just like the normal tend to follow pool but there we've got prizes down to 500th place so we've made it much more kind of spread out and every penny that we take in stakes in those fivers will go straight out to uh, to to redistribute amongst the amongst the um the the winners so there's no takeout for the tote there it's a pure a pure pool that that doesn't have any takeout so it's just everybody every man for himself every woman for herself and at a straight fair go picking up all those points over the four days of Cheltenham. So in my hypothetical situation, it's not too late for my, my loser friend who happens to be an expert. No, and he can take you on from a, from scratch in the mini game as well as trying to get past you again in the big game. Oh, very good. Johnny, have you anything, any, any advice here for anybody um, wanting to pick any in the tent to follow? In terms of actual horses? That's your look. You were just very silent there for a moment. I wanted to check. You were still with us first off yeah. and that you're okay. You okay, hon? Um, yeah, yeah, all good. Your your loser friend is still here. Um, yeah, uh, look for, obviously look for the bonus races and pick the winners of them. Simple as that, really. <laughs> that is as simple as that. And, and when you do go through them, it's like you look at the, the big bonus races. So it's the Arkle, the Champion Hurdle, the Brown Advisory Chase, Queen Mum, the Ryanair, Stayers, Gold Cup, and the County Hurdle. And, and like I said, the County Hurdle is probably the toughest there. If you're looking for what on paper is the cheapest 50 points you can get would be Monkfish, in the brown advisory that's that's the, certainly the shortest in terms of in terms of the 50 point the 50 point races that that the, the whole kind of um general fantasy strategy is uh, is actually really interesting because if you if you pick what everybody else is picking it's not really going to work out in the end you need to pick most of the stuff that people are picking so you don't miss out on the big ones yeah. and the easy ones but it's those final few selections that always divide the, the people who finish in the top 1% and the people who finish 10th or 11%. 
Absolutely. And what, what we've seen with some of the people that have got, come in and already playing the Cheltenham version, they'll have nine bankers uh, and then they'll just perm up that last one in the county. So you might you might spend 55 euro and do te- do 10 county hurdle chances and, and then you'll throw in your monkfishes, your envoy allens, your kind of appreciate its honeysuckles alongside that and try and try and try and nick it with the with the county all right well uh, give us a give us a banker that we might not have heard too much from people jamie what, what do you what do you think personally oh the one i think you're looking for things that people haven't put in at the start so the, the ones that weren't so popular at the start um concertista is not very popular uh from the people that have entered early um that's you know that's going to be around the 65 chance for a grade one so you're getting the 25 points for the mayor's hurdle there um appreciate it was quite quite popular shack and Poussois was popular monkfish was less popular you will be coming you know you, that's it's like i say that one's probably the the cheapest 50 points that, that on paper that we'll have um Imperial Aura uh, in the Ryanair wasn't popular at all. Uh, if you're looking at the Gold Cup, uh, which is a, again is a 50-point race, obviously it's a big race. Um, Aplutar wasn't that popular. Uh, Champ was over popular. Um, Frodon obviously has scored well so far, but not many people have got it. I think uh, out, out of those, Manella Indo was probably the most popular because p- people thought it would have scored um, more points over the, in Ireland mm. up to now. So if any, you know, he still scored, scored points, but probably is as as not amassed as many points as people thought they'd they'd be picking up a few more great easy grade ones with that before Cheltenham. Um it's I think again Goshen people weren't sure about. So uh, that's been that's been less picked at the start of the of the season, whereas Honeysuckle and Epitante were very popular. Um Energamini Energamine, that one's not been anywhere near as popular as Shishkin. All right. mankind all mankind is has hardly been picked. Um, so if, if that if that comes about if if Shishkin and Ergamen, if anything happens to them and all mankind comes and, and picks them up then that could jump you to the to the that could be fifty points that really jumps you ahead of other people. Can I just ask a general data question here? Are, yeah. Do you find that the trends in what the uh, picks that people make match the prices? And when when are there the biggest variances between what people are picking in these free or the small stake contests versus what the actual SPs tend to be? I think you, I think people overplay when it when it's free and it makes no difference who you're picking. You're you're getting fifty points pretty much. I mean, we do get the extra points for for your um, the uh, if you have a unit each way on the tote, we we add that on. So that's why, like last year in the stayers hurdle, the biggest point scorer of the, of Cheltenham was Liz, Liz Nagar Oscar in the stayers because it had just such a big tote payout. But you'll find that people are over index on the favourites. Um, so if if something's a a 50, uh, an even money chance, and it will take seventy percent of the picks. Right, that's interesting. You know, so, it? Yeah, so it's, so if you are coming, in, probably the underpicked ones are the second, third favourites. Uh, are probably underpicked. So you should so you should looking around, especially for the t- for the Cheltenham tend to follow the mini game where it is very concentrated. Uh, you want to be picking, perhaps throwing in a couple of the, the second favourites, third favourites. They will be underrepresented. The other thing with that, because we've only got four days in the in the mini game. You should bear in mind that there's a, the dead heat rules. For the dead heat rules, is whoever gets their ticket in first, the kind of time stamp on your ticket is important there because it's it's based. If everybody, if three people have got the same the same points, then the the first in the list will be the one that's got the ticket in earliest. And if you put your ticket in now, you can still change every one of your ten up right. until that ten o'clock. So you may as well put some tickets in now, even if you're not completely sure about them. You get your ticket in now, and then you can still change it up till ten o'clock on Monday. So right. you've still got that timestamp from now, and there'll be a hell of a lot of people that are entering in that last twenty-four hours. So it's worth worth getting in early just to get ahead on those dead heats. Jamie, good stuff. Thank you, William, for joining us and explaining all that to us. Cheers. No problem. Good it's stuff. A, Jamie Hart. There's expl- a lovely bet um, next week, Ger. If it, the play spot was one of the, I remember one of the first bets I did at Cheltenham when I got into the first Cheltenham I watched, which was in the Viscount in Whitehall, uh, all those years ago, and they they built this big bookmaker shop beside it and got to know all these characters. But we did the play spot, and it was like if you if you, you just get a horse place in every race, you can pick two or three selections in some races, and if you take on favourites that 
for whatever reason disappoint you can get a massive payout because the pool is so big so if you are that really really casual kind of um racing fan listening in the play spot is a lovely bet and like check out the papers as well they'll be giving away like i remember these give free play spot bets um, on the week and you can get involved in Cheltenham without really spending much if, if anything the Tote Tent to Follow Cheltenham Festival minigame is now also open for entries. Visit tote.ie to select your stable of horses and enter them into either the free or the paid game, which has prizes for the top 500 finishers. And you can enter until 10 o'clock on Monday the 15th on tote.ie. Just a reminder of the standings. 349.48, that's me and Johnny, 305.98. But look, I, I would, if in, those, in that hypothetical scenario, I would definitely let the expert win because, you know, fragile human condition right now at the moment you don't want to be playing around with somebody's well, fragile has it well, just the whole it world it's, it's, it's fragile for the be- fragile time for the best of us sure to be honest it's true don't worry I mean you know mm. where are you going to watch Sheltenham yourself probably in here most of the time in in, mm. in our in our lair here and then uh, also at home so I'm looking forward to it what, is there anything specific that's come out in the last 24 hours that you were like oh that's a bit of a surprise not really, no. Like a kind of a couple of non-runners here, or there of not not really. It, it, you know, I remember Shaq and Porsoir coming out on the day last year, so I'm just hoping now that all the the main players take their chance. Um, it's obviously there are obviously fewer Irish runners. Paul kind of advertised the difficulty in getting over there, but it's more the fact that there isn't a crowd this year. It, it, it's maybe not quite as tempting, but essentially all the male players are there, and there are very few injuries this year as well, which is interesting. All right. Well, look. As I said, day by day, hour by hour, we'll be having live coverage for you across all of our platforms on otbsports.com and on the OTB Sports app. That's this week's edition of Friday Night Racing, the very last one before Cheltenham. Next week, we'll be talking, no doubt, with some uh, winners and losers and looking back on a fabulous week and also uh, casting forward to the uh, Gold Cup, which is obviously on the Friday. Friday Night Racing and Off the Ball, brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland love every racing moment visit hri.ie